This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 474, recorded on Thursday, July 24th, 2014. Science, science everywhere. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki and this is TWIS, This Week in Science. We are going to thrill your life and fill your heads with the origin of all life, spider life, and a recipe for microbial detox. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The last hundred years of human history have been the most human-filled hundred years of Earth's history. More humans are sharing the planet at this moment than have ever shared the planet before. And so, now that we are here in this, the most successful evolutionary population explosion in human history, what shall we do with our great numbers? Shall we look to the past? and seek to better the accomplishments of our ancestors. We could build a bigger pyramid, this time locating it somewhere where tourists would feel safe traveling to. Shall we look to the now and see what good we could do to immediately impact our daily lives? We could tackle the issues of today, only with so many of us it's often hard to agree and comment upon just what those issues are, though there are plenty to choose from. Or shall we look to the future? and imagine the great accomplishments we could set in motion today that would truly change the destiny of all mankind forevermore. We could set in motion the makings of magnificent moon colony, or pave the way to an energy independent tomorrow by investing in alternative energies. And while it is most likely that most humans sharing the world today wouldn't select any of these options, it has always been a small percentage of the population with the vision and dedication to bring about great things that improve the world and make a future a better place. And that small percentage of people have never been in such great numbers as they are today on This Week in Science, coming up next. And Blair. Good science to you, Justin and Blair. Oh, I love having the, the band all back together. Oh, that yeah. makes me happy. Yeah, happy day of science, everyone. Welcome to this week in science. We are going to thrill you and fill your heads once again. We've got a great show ahead. On this week's show, Tons of science news. I brought news stories about information and ice, microbes and digestion, and maybe learning some lessons from lionfish. Cool. What'd you bring, Justin? Let's see. I have got the origins of all life today. <laughs> I've got, uh, what do I got? Desert planets, desert beaches. I got uh, the cut of the jib, making a difference in the career. And, ooh, a story that you will wish that you hadn't heard. That's always fun. <laughs> we always love them. Is it up there with face mites? Uh, <laughs> it might be. It <laughs> might be. My favorite. It might be. <laughs> well, we have so much to look forward to. Yowzers! Yeah. Blair, what did you bring? Oh, I brought so many animals. Let's see. I brought spiders. I brought fish. I brought uh, meerkats and dogs. <laughs> and if there's time, uh, one of my favorite stories, so I'll definitely make time, meat. Meat. Mm -hmm. A form All of right. animals I don't often talk about, but All this right. week we will talk about I it. I just like the, the uh, introduction there. This story is about meat. Meat. There we go. Okay, looking forward to that one. <laughs> I actually have a friend who, who taught his children the names of animals based on the meat. So instead of pig, it was pork. Instead of cow, it was beef. Chicken, though, eh, got to be chicken. Poultry? Poultry? It was still chicken. Chicken was the only one, I think, that had its right name. That's funny. 
All right, let's dive into the news. There's some great news this week in the brain research front. Uh, Nature, pu publication in Nature magazine, uh, shows uh, scientists have found 108 genetic variants tied to schizophrenia. They analyzed the genomes of 150,000 people. 37,000 of them were diagnosed with schizophrenia, and so knowing the the genomes which one which people had had the diet the diagnosis um, which people were maybe related to people who had had diagnoses all sorts of information about the individuals involved 108 genetic variants tied to this disorder researchers say while the suspect variation identified so far only explains about 3.5 percent of the risk for schizophrenia these results warrant exploring whether using such data to calculate an individual's risk for developing the disorder might someday be useful in screening for preventive interventions. Mm -hmm. um, even based on these early predictors, people who score in the top 10% of risk may be up to 20-fold more prone to developing schizophrenia. So having these variants isn't, you know, it's, a, it's not a promise that you're going to develop it, but this is, you know, figuring out a little bit more about... Uh, of the puzzle to why our brain system goes haywire in some individuals and leads to the disorder of schizophrenia. And then the ex other exciting news, uh, Ted Stanley, he's a philanthropist, is awarding $650 million to the Broad Institute. He's already given them $175 million, but now he's giving them an additional $650 million just to study psychiatric research and the molecular underpinnings of things like mm -hmm. schizophrenia to under wow. and to develop treatments. But he's only given the money to Broads? <laughs> the Broad Institute. Oh, okay. He's only giving the money to educated broads. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Institutionalized broads. Ah. I... Yeah. So uh, Ted Stanley, who's giving this money, hopefully it'll open up um, open up a lot of doors in terms of understanding how the molecules in the brain play Tetris and fit so, together so or don't in some situations. Major. Incredible yeah. donation to science. I'm, I'm guessing, without knowing anything about this individual, they probably have a friend or family member that suffered from this and is seeking... His son was bipolar and, quote from Stanley, there was a pill that saved his life. Okay. Essentially, it gave him the ability to have a normal life with a normal functioning brain. If I had the same downfall at the same age that he had, I would have, it w I would have had my life ruined. Because in between when I was that age and he was that age, someone had discovered that lithium makes people well when they have that illness. Mm. Lithium is more of a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. It can help people. <laughs> and so hopefully what's going to happen is this money will make a, a much a more chisel. targeted... A chisel. Mm. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly, Blair. <laughs> yeah, much more targeted treatments possible. And so that's what we're hoping for and looking at. A oh, chisel? yay. What are you two, Stone Age? <laughs> yeah. Well, More laser, laser, laser etching I machine. Was, there we go. That's what makes sense after the sledgehammer, right? Sledgehammer, wham, chisel. Stone Age. And eventually lasers. <laughs> lasers, of course. That's, that's in like 50 years, though. We need to graduate from the sledgehammer to the chisel, and then we'll get the laser later. It'll be fine. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Justin's like, I don't know if I like this analogy. <laughs> I'm going to argue the analogy, <laughs> not the so science. Cool. Okay, so like the other thing... Come first. That's all I was thinking. So the other thing, though, about this research is not only did they are they trying to figure out what molecularly is happening, but they're looking at the genetics behind it, right? So that means that you can know who to watch. Not necessarily you'll know, all right, 100%, this child is going to be schizophrenic when they grow up. No, it's going to be more, this is a child that should probably see somebody from adolescence, make sure they don't go crazy. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So I think that could be really beneficial to know who to watch so that it doesn't happen all of a sudden and then that person's life is ruined. As you can see as it starts to onset and then you can start to treat it yeah. Before it takes over their life. 
I think it be, could be really fantastic. So can I? I'm going to dive into a, a into a story real quick because I've got one I think that overlaps this. Okay, great. Uh, this is a, they've got a uh, they've developed a new technique that can in human beings map the the methylation that takes the DNA methylation, which is an epigenetic change to a DNA code um, in early development. Right, and one of the things that it's very possible that this could allude to is very early on being able to track where methylation is happening. Where there's their standard genetic code, here's where the alternations are taking place. You would be able to maybe predict stuff like this if you see an area that's being affected that only gets affected in in individuals that have schizophrenia or X Y Z disease, whatever it is you may be able to get in really early. I mean, this is tracking stuff around development, uh, you know, uh, embryonic development. You might be able to get way ahead of any other indicators of disease to know what to look for, what to be sort of a, uh, a sentinel for in terms of uh, these things being produced. So it's, and it's a pretty, pretty wild, uh, pretty wild jump because we haven't been able, we've known that epigenetics is taking place, and epigenetic uh, through DNA methylation is you have your standard genes that you get from mom and dad, and then you have these sort of tweaks and alterations that also come along and add to things based on uh, based on your development in utero and even later on environmental changes. So being able to track them and seeing where your standard code is getting sort of deviated or expressed more you know, pushed in one direction versus the other uh, could be really huge. They also think it's going to have uh, a pretty big impact in being able to help infertility in couples, that sort of thing. So, That'd be interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Cool. Yeah, the, the idea, if you could go in and affect epigenetic change, change methylation that would lead to certain disorders or um, impairments before a child actually is born and not actually tweak the genetic code just make right. sure that uh, that what is being expressed is being expressed correctly right and that right would be time. the next that would be the yeah. very next wave of this first is identifying seeing uh, being able to see how methylation is taking place yeah seeing where the, the, the changes to you know ex gene expression are being focused yeah but that next one you're right what if then you can prevent uh, epigenetic changes in one area or another and stay a little truer to just the pure inherited genes. Um, still a long way out from being able to do the predictions Yeah. what yeah, changes sure. you're making and who can roll the dice? Who can say, well, we think you could try this, you could try that, we can experiment with the unborn child, it won't happen. But we've got, once we can see it and begin to record the mechanisms behind diseases at this early stage of epigenetic uh, adjustments in development, in utero even. This is what's going to give us the blueprint to fight diseases that are genetically inherited or epigenetically altered into us. Uh, this, this, is a, an, this is like almost a new field of science in, in medicine that is about to open up for us. Yeah, but there's so little we understand. This is not something that, I mean, when we say open up, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen right away or even any time in the next 10 it years. It may take weeks. <laughs> weeks, yeah. <laughs> or or decades. Or, yeah. But at the rate that we've been doing these advances, I mean, we talk, I, I'm saying decades because in my head, that should take decades to unlock something like this. But how long have we even known that epigenetics existed? Five years, six years, seven. I mean, really, we, we're no. People about have that. been people have been studying epi epigenetics for longer than that, but it's been um, much more recent, within probably the last decade, that we've come to understand the absolute influence that it has on on our phenotype, which is how we look, how the genes are expressed. Um, that and so that I, I think that influence. That's pretty. That's pretty recent. Stones, methylation, yeah. So, so the past wait, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, I, I, we always think, gosh, it takes a long time to uncover because we're looking backwards. Looking forward, I think there's an acceleration 
in science right now. I think there's such an acceleration of how quickly things come from an initial discovery to a next breakthrough and a next one that it might not be the 50-year plan. It could really be a decade, and we'll have it. I highly doubt that. I highly doubt a decade just based on the rate of, not just the rate of science, but also the rate of implementation and application. I think we're still a good ways off. Um, and, it, and I'm going to use this to tie into also how people think about things and what, and what we think about. Um, climate change is one where what people think about climate change, we often uh, seem to assume there have been studies that, sh that show it that there's political affiliation or religious affiliation that can office, often influence the way that people think about climate change and what's happening in the world. Um, and we're getting to a point, as Blair working in the field currently, we're getting to a, a point where we need to start changing minds and get people to start thinking about doing things so that we can actually, you know, actually uh, keep up and surf this yeah. wave of climate change that's occurring. Um, and so a study have, was, just, was just published by a guy, Yelp, a guy, a Yale professor, Dan Kahan. Um, he's Some dude. Studying, <laughs> Some dude, you know, whatever. Um, he, he was looking at um, where, how people get their information, and it actually turns out from, uh, he, he started asking not just about what people uh, personally believed about climate change, but what they actually understood scientifically. And it turns out that it's, that what we're dealing with is not what people understand, but actually what they believe in the end. Because in his study, he actually just asked them climate science literacy questions and general science literacy questions and found that people who do not agree with the idea of climate change being anthropogenically caused um, and that there's something that we can do about it, they know as much about climate change as people who do agree that climate change is occurring. So based on this study, the science literacy, the climate science literacy on this issue is exactly the same in both in across the board. It's not how much people know, it's what they're hearing from various places and what they have come to believe based on that information. So um, there is what's brought up in this Ars Technica article that I think is very interesting is there's currently a uh, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science movement, there's a campaign to try and get people to understand more about climate science. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether or not it's actually going to work and make any difference because people already either understand climate science or they don't and they believe whatever they believe anyway. Okay. Right, so what's, what so you need to do do is not change what or not add to what people know. What needs to be done is we need to change how people think about it. Okay, because Blair. They, they they have the facts, right. but they're not connecting the dots in the right way. Blair, so yeah. you and I, I think we're on the same page. So you know what the next step is. This makes me nervous actually hearing right. you say yeah, this. I'm very nervous <laughs> now. What's Go ahead. Ahead. Probably, Christian Fundamental Revivalist Tabernacle of Anti-Global Warming. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. Can you see the earth is getting warmer? It's because Jesus wants us to stop it. Jesus wants us. I mean, this is what it's going to take, right? No. No, 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 no. So, no. Nope. This, this is, is the what's only happening. Way that the people reason. People are immune to scientific information, okay, at this point. They're immune to it. It's blah, 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 noise, noise, noise. You need to create a charismatic band of traveling religious zealots who also are pushing the fact that we need to save the planet. As but it's well not necessarily, our, our it's not necessarily, soul. it's not religious necessarily. It's no, no, that's just, that's, one. that's just one, just one thing. The other one is you got to put their on friend. a suit and you got to say, uh, stocks uh, market is looking to lose more than 30% if the global warming increases. To and in, in, you've got you've got to hit them at all those fronts in which they care about nothing else than their own thing that they believe in, whatever it is, right? Those who believe out of ignorance, I'm satisfied. <laughs> but then again, so is the other side. So this is the problem. <laughs> 
Because who are you going to reach? If you want to make those who already think global warming is a problem and have deferred to science to have the opinion that they're going to follow, you could spend all of your efforts increasing their scientific understanding of the issue and impact the issue globally, not at all. So, if your mission, if, you're, if what you're actually attempting to accomplish is to change those minds who are believing on a belief system that have locked out climate change or science because of political or religious ideology, you need to break through that barrier and speak to them from within their own ideology. I think I, that that is the key point. That is the key point that has been um, has been supported by research. Is that people tend to respect the opinions of people they know, and so they listen to people they know, whether that is within their book club, whether it's within their family, whether it's in with, within their church. What or their you know or their money laundering operation like whatever it has whatever it is, people respect the people they know and will listen to them and agree with them and take on those opinions much more readily than they will even some person on the television. So yeah. So there's there's a couple other things at play here. So there's we all have these kind of mental maps. Right, and so we are given mental maps by the people that we trust, by the societies that we're in, and so that is the job now as climate science interpreters that we have. That's so difficult is to find new roads on that map because you can't try to send them somewhere on a different map in their brain. It's not going to work, and that's why if they've been told that it snows in the winter, so climate change is not true they've been told that they're going to be stuck on that path and you can't ask them to jump from Oklahoma to New York City in their mental map you have to take them on the roads that they know so yep. you have to find a way you have to define it as global warming is the devil's way of creating hell on earth or it's part of the homosexual agenda to get everybody in hot pants so <laughs> this is, this is, yeah. here's the other thing though we're scientists and I don't want any of us to lose our credibility as scientists in trying to teach people about climate change and get people on the wagon. Because the second right. that we start using gimmicks and we start using all of these kind of emotionally persuasive arguments, we are going to be recognized as doing what the people on the other side are so good at doing, right. which so we are not well versed in. So now we have to find a way to appeal to, a people, to people's value systems and to use logic models they already have to explain the issue. You assume they have them. Yeah, I think good luck with that because it hasn't worked to me. And opinions. And we got to keep problem. working on stories here, people. This I know, is a show, I know. I just, and I love this conversation. Tactic when the issue and the importance of it's so big. Okay. Uh, well, I have a climate change oh. story. Yes, uh, and I have another climate change story also. This is climate change week. Okay, you go, and then I'll go. Climate, ch climate change, so one thing that people often bring up when they talk about not agreeing with climate change is like, well, there's uh, scientists aren't sure about the data. Well, there's a study out right now um, in which, yeah, the scientists are kind of wondering and scratching their heads at the data because the algorithm, the software that they used to analyze sea ice, um, they've call they call it the bootstrap software. There's, uh, they had two different algorithms. One was called NASA Team and a second called Bootstrap. And Bootstrap is what the IPCC climate reports used. Well, between the two, there's a difference in the way that the IC ice was analyzed. And so there's an error that is inherent in the changeover when the NASA team software was upgraded to Bootstrap. And then there was Bootstrap 1 and Bootstrap 2. And there there's all there's some strange stuff going on. Um, so anyway, algorithm issues. Sea ice in Antarctica is still expanding more than in the Arctic, but it's a more gradual expansion than what was thought uh, previously, which that can be explained a little bit more easily 
than the rapid expan expansion that was uh, being seen as a result of one of the other of one of the other algorithms. So sometimes there are mistakes that are made, but the entire scientific community is not questioning the results as a whole, and the results as a whole do still stand. They just are going to be shifted slightly. Somebody else, go ahead. Um, real quick climate change story. I love this. Uh, red meat may be more of an impact on climate change than driving a car. <laughs> So beef and other land meat uh, has a lot of environmental impact and uh, it also has a very strong carbon output. Um, popular red meat requires 28 times more land to produce uh, than pork or chicken, um, so beef does, 11 times more water and it's five times more climate warming emissions, all just than pork or chicken. And then when compared to something like potatoes, wheat, or rice, the impact of beef per calorie is even more extreme. It takes 160 times more land and 11 times more greenhouse gases. Um, and I'm so, a vegetarian. I get to keep my Hummer. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Over <Yes>. my cold, <laughs> dead colon. Here's the other thing. Um, we are expecting 2 billion more people by 2050. And the amount of meat that we feed the world, if we if we change that to plants, oh. it would feed pretty much all of those people and then some. What if we got little tiny cows? Just little. Or little you cows. could just eat cow still, but eat less of it. Maybe or have tiny steaks. Of, or we could just switch to cannibalism. And eat the two billion new people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's that, um, and more than kiri kiri. More, that, no. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, more than a hundred cool, grams cool. of meat per day. That's considered a meat rich diet. So if you eat meat two to three times a day, you're you have a meat rich diet. Rich diet. That is about seven point two kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions per day. Um, and then, um, let's see. In contrast. Vegetarian and fish eating diets, they both of them have about the same carbon dioxide, 3.8 kilograms per day. And vegan diets is 2.9 kilograms. And um, that it was a pretty big sample size. They looked at uh, about 60,000 people and then they figured out the carbon footprint based on that, the emissions from that. So definitely, I'm not saying don't eat meat at all. Uh, but that's that's actually the reason, the number one reason that I don't eat red meat is because of the environmental impact uh, and because Americans eat so much. But um, if you just eat less, you're going to cut down on a huge amount of carbon emissions. So you could try your meatless Mondays. You could try to eat just less meat within a meal. But it's something to consider, not just your cars and um, your electricity. It's also the food that you're eating. A lot of people don't realize food creates carbon emissions also. So, yeah. That's so is the one, it's 100, 100 grams of meat a day. Is that the, yeah, they're recommended, which is kind of, and 100 grams is kind of like the, they say it's like the playing deck, deck of cards kind of size. And, and so that's just, longer. that's considered meat rich, which I think Americans <laughs> might eat more than that. On average. Oh, we definitely do. Yeah. Americans in general definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we eat a lot of meat. We don't get we enough like exercise. <laughs> yeah, look at us. We're not healthy. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Justin, is all life on Earth alive and well today? What's the origin of it? Where did it yes, come for from? As long as evolution has been understood, mankind has been seeking the origin of the life on this earth. What was the first life? How did it get here? What were the chemicals involved? Can we recreate it in the laboratory? So this is interesting. This is the University of, each, uh, of East Ang Anglia. Uh, states here, parts of the primordial soup in which life arose may have been maintained in our cells today. Huh. Research published today in the journal Biological Chemistry reveals how cells in plants, yeast, and very likely also in animals, still perform 
the ancient reactions, the ones thought to have been responsible for the origin of life four billion-ish years ago, right? That first chemical reaction that created life still taking place in every cell. So the primordial, uh, primordial soup theory suggests that life began in a pond, ocean, some sort of muck, in a result yeah, like combination some kind of, of metal kind of pocket of mud or something that just some happened. Mud under, yeah, that's another thing. things together. The, the, uh, the <clears throat> what do you call them? The thermal vents under the ocean? Mm -hmm. And that there were clays involved, that maybe there were. Mm -hmm. That sort of created the simulation of yeah. cell structure. Proto cells, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a combination of that metals, gases from the atmosphere, some form of energy, maybe lightning strike, hallelujah, to make the building blocks, the proteins, which would then evolve into everything. New research shows how small pockets of a cell in the mitochondria, or actually, yep, they're describing the mitochondria, continue to perform a similar reaction in our bodies. These reactions involve iron, sulfur, and an electrochemistry stimulus, and are still important for functions such as respiration uh, in animals and photosynthesis in plants. Hmm. I, think, I think what's interesting here is that basically what this means is that sulfur and these compounds are really dangerous to ourselves and our cells, and would kill the cells if they weren't if the cells or the mitochondria didn't handle it properly. And so we've got the mitochondria playing with fire, so to speak, inside the cells and producing these toxic compounds. And, and also these were important. And, we don't, and, and we, we're still making it as opposed to getting it from our diet nowadays. Right. And these right. are the compounds that are considered to have been available in our primordial soup. You know. Says, like for example, small pockets of a cell, uh, mitochondria, deal with the electrochemistry and also with toxic sulfur metabolism. Very ancient reactions thought to have been important for the origin of life itself. Our research has shown that toxic sulfur compound is being exported by a mitochondrial transport protein to other parts of the cell. We need sulfur for making iron sulfur catalysts. Again, ancient chemical process. The work shows that the parts of the primordial soup in which life arose has been maintained in our cells even today and is in fact harnessed to maintain important biological reactions. So that primordial soup is... Primordial cellular soup. I'm getting in touch with my ooze. In every I love that you can say. Uh, well, but how, how did life start? How do you know that happened in the primordial soup? Look in my mitochondria. Buddy. That's right. I got soup in my That's mitochondria right, yeah. right now. So a little bit of bad news also this week. This is from the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. A team of astronomers made their most precise to date analysis measurement of water vapor in the atmosphere of Jupiter-like planets beyond our solar system. They're looking at exoplanets in search of water and have thus far found nothing but deserts. Hmm. Today, our model, uh, so it says the low water vapor levels are surprising, says Cruzit, one of the, Dr. Nicholas Cruzit, Dunlap Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Our models predict a much higher abundance of water vapor. And so these results challenge our current understanding of planet formation, and they raise questions about our ability to identify water in an Earth-like exoplanet. Uh, according to the core accretion theory of planet formation, planetary systems form a huge disk of hydrogen gas and dust around a star. Over a period of a million years or so, dust particles get clumped up together. They form larger and larger grains. Eventually, the grains come together and form a planetesimal, which eventually coalesce into a planet. At the same time, gravity in the planet attracts an atmosphere of gas from the disk. The theory predicts that a planet's most abundant element will be oxygen, hmm. which would take the form of water vapor in the atmosphere. Very low levels of water vapor discovered by the researchers raise questions about our understanding of the chemical processes involved in planet formation. 
Results also give astronomers an idea of what they face in searching for an exoplanet capable of supporting life. I just so, wonder... Yeah. What a bummer news for the water-rich water. universe. But I just wonder, though, I'm just wondering why... Uh, I, I, I don't understand enough about this, obviously. Why wouldn't something like methane be more abundant? Why wouldn't something, why is it specifically water vapor? I mean, mm -hmm. is it because these are super hot, they're, they're hot Jupiters, they're giant hot Jupiters that uh, would have have somehow the heat in their uh, pro gaseous proce processes would have led to the water vapor being present in the atmosphere as opposed to something else, but I'm just curious why why would why would you expect there to be a lot of water in these hot jupiters why wouldn't it have evaporated why wouldn't it have been the why wouldn't these jupiters have been so hot that it would have caused it to evaporate away end up out away from the planet would gravity have pulled it in i yeah i think some yeah. of it partially right is about the fact that uh hydrogen bonds are so strong and so if there was oxygen and hydrogen to be had that right. water would make the most sense to show up because right. it's going to be the strongest, most kind of compelling molecule to form um, and it's going to be the hardest to break up after the fact. So I know that it has like, it has a higher uh, or a lower um, evaporation temperature but that when it's in the vapor form I feel like it's really hard to break up. But. Part of this too is that, it, that from based on the model that they had in mind of what they would expect to find, the numbers were between 10 to 1,000 times less water vapors. And I don't know where this model comes from. I would assume you would compare a planet that is Jupiter-like to our own Jupiter. Right? I'm just guessing that that's the model for a Jupiter-like planet. So if it's 10 times less, ah, yeah, maybe we just hit it at the wrong time. Yeah, maybe right. it's just a, a dry season on that solar system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thousand times less? Yikes. Now you're really talking about that's probably a dry solar system. Yeah. Dr. Morbius in the chat room is saying, because if you had methane, methane is a reducing agent. It gets oxidized to water and carbon dioxide. So hence you would have end up having water and carbon dioxide being more present in the atmosphere. There you go. Thanks for that, Dr. Morbius. Cool. Also, it gets broken down by UV light into longer chain hydrocarbons, like in Titan's atmosphere. Also, this there we go. Possibility, sad science. Sad science. Possibility science. that there could be a flaw in our ability to detect water. water vapor with a laser in a planet that's not in our solar system. Yeah, because really, because really, what we're looking at is the the color, the light spectra, right? Mm -hmm. The particular energetic spectra, and so there may, yeah, there may be some errors there. Is it time for animals? Sure. Is it time? I believe it's time for. She loves our creatures. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let me get right into the fish and sexual dimorphism. What's sexual dimorphism, you ask? It's when males and females look different. Well, we're used to it happening externally. But now we found some internal sexual dimorphism in fish. Which, usually there's that one area that's sexually dimorphic, right? Gonads usually are sexually dimorphic. But all the mm -hmm. other internal stuff going on, pretty similar. 
Yeah, That's like the kidneys are going to be mm-hmm. pretty similar. The liver is going to be pretty similar. Every men have nipples. Stomach. Yep. All that. Yep. Men have nipples. Exactly. There are all sorts of things that are very, very similar. Right. Yes. But now they found a type of fish where the swim bladder is totally different for a male and a female. Now, this- now. Now, what what exactly is a swim bladder? I'm so glad you asked. So, <laughs> the swim bladder is the organ that controls the buoyancy of a fish. So it it um, is kind of how they control their water and salt balance in their body in relation to the water they're in. And that's how they can move up and down in the water column. They control their buoyancy with their swim bladder. What they it's found kind of like a like a submarine getting rid yeah. of gas or yeah, yeah exactly. And so this fish Silorhynchus, the genus of fish that they studied, South Asian torrent minnows. They're called that because they live in really fast flowing water. So in the fast flowing water, they if they were too buoyant, they would get swept away. So these fish have really tiny swim bladders, teeny tiny ones. What they found was that the males actually had swim bladders that were up to 98 times as large as the females. That's pretty big. That's very big. Yeah. They also found another unidentified organ that the females didn't have at all on top of that swim bladder. And so it looks like there's a couple reasons that that could be. It could be that because the male has larger bones and larger muscles and that they have this extra organ that they weigh so much more that they need a bigger swim bladder. So that makes sense. But now why do they weigh so much more? Why do they have all this extra stuff? Why do they have this extra organ? Well, so so, so they can support a, a larger swim bladder. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. some good empirical thinking there. Great, great. <laughs> um, so actually, this organ, funny enough, is ta- is is shaped kind of like a tuning fork, and it's made of dense connective tissue, and they think that it might have a function related to making sound. Hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it might be... So they think that this modified muscle is a drumming muscle. They use the enlarged bone to drum against the swim bladder like a drumstick. So the swim bladder could be keeping them afloat. It could also be secondarily used to make noise. Because this fast-flowing water is really noisy, so they need to make even more noise to be heard by the females. And this is what's crazy. They've been studying the Silorhynchus genus for 170 years. They've known about this fish. But only now, Dr. Kevin Conway, this guy, decided to study their internal anatomy. He cut them open, and that's when he saw this crazy difference. So for 170 years, no one thought to cut open these fish and look at their internal anatomy. Or or maybe they did cut them open, but they didn't notice because they were only looking at all males, or they were, you know, nobody did a comparison of males to females to see if there were any kinds of differences. I wonder, though, with the 170 years also, if the males are using this this mu- this bone muscle thing this muscle thing as a, a drumming structure they should have seen some kind of behaviors in the male fish at some point over the 170 years that would have indicated they were making sounds or doing something different from the females or or in a hundred and however many years there have been three studies right, <laughs> right. so this is this is what this uh, scientist said I love this quote he says Our study nicely demonstrates that there are still scientific mysteries remaining to be discovered. One just needs to look. You just need to cut things up. I love it. I think (laughs) it's fantastic. We've been looking at these fish for 170 years, but we weren't looking at the right thing. 
And bam, Science. there's animals. Where's my knife? Whoa. All of a sudden, there's animals that have sexually dimorphic organs. Their swim bladder's different. And this guy has this tuning fork muscle. It's insane. Yeah, well, it's not, I mean, you start thinking of it as, I mean, hmm. you don't, you start thinking of it net less as like a, a, I mean, it is sexual dimorphism, but like mm. maybe the swim bladder, it's a little bit different because it's not necessarily, it's not like lungs necessarily or, mm. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think through how this would, could be. Yeah. Something more than a case of enlarged swim bladder to deal with the uh, the enlarged bones and muscle mm -hmm. weight of being or mass of being a male. Also, ad adding to it maybe some mating component of being able to make sounds, and suddenly you have this larger organ. But I mean, we have sexual dimorphism in size and mass and all sorts of stuff. Right. I think the, the big thing is the, is the 98 times, though. Like, does an adult male human have a liver that's 98 times the size of a female liver? That is a huge yeah. difference. No, but we have a whole extra rib, which if you're looking at modern society, you could, if, as from a fish perspective, you might say, well, the male human has an extra rib to help contain the beer he drinks. Like, right, but one extra rib is not 98 times the size of your ribs. This is what I'm trying to say. It's not just, oh, the male has a larger one because blank. It's right. way more way profound bigger. than that. 98 yeah. times. It doesn't keep up with the proportion. With proportion. Yeah. It's exactly. out of proportion. Exactly. Massively. But yeah. it's one's bigger. The other one, you don't even have it. If it was just a bigger rib that we had, that would be one thing. But you don't even have the rib. Well, I'm just saying there's what this study is is seeing is something that scientists habitually don't look at very much, and that's internal anatomy for sexual dimorphism in species. They don't look at it that much. So maybe it's something now that we'll see more of. And I don't know. It could be cool. very exciting. On that comic is maybe you're right, but it could also be that there isn't very much of it in nature. And this is just one of the weird cases where there happens to be. Right? I don't know. I, I haven't cut up any animals to look at the differences between male and female internally. So maybe maybe it's all over the place. But I have a feeling it's pretty rare. Yeah, we'll see. One just mm -hmm. has to look. Um, and then my other story, pretty short, but orb weaver spiders, a favorite of mine in stories. Well, the largest ever study of spider genetics has found out something about orb weaver spiders. Which, first of all, let's just take a tick to consider that. The largest ever study of spider genetics. So, the all of a sudden, they're being able to study a lot more animal genetics because sequencing technology has dropped dramatically in cost. So before researchers could only study only a handful of genes, now that they can examine the entire genome of particular organisms. And so they can change the questions that they ask and the questions that they answer. Even just five years ago, they would spend thousands of dollars to sequence 3,000 genes, and today just a few hundred dollars sequences millions, almost the entire genome. And so they were allowed to sequence genes from 14 different spider species, the largest genomic data set for the study of spiders. So 14 maybe doesn't sound like that much, but that's a pretty large amount of spider species to sequence their entire genome. And so they were able to look at phylogenies that were constructed based on uh, anatomical sorting, right? And so orb weaver spiders for example, were put together because they're these kind of weirdo spiders. No other spiders do it. There's just these species of spiders that make these special funnel orb webs to catch these animals that are totally different from anything else that spiders do. So you would see that. You would see those characteristics and you would put all those spiders together. It sounds like something that would have evolved and then all these other spiders broke off from that strain. But they found that two different groups of orb weaver spiders evolved independently. 
And so now they're starting a study that where they're going to look hopefully at 150 spider species to test that hypothesis. That's what they figured out from this initial test. Two different groups of orb weaver spiders happened independently. So now they have to ask, did it happen independently or the other option from their molecular data, because all they know is this is a polyphyletic group. So either they evolved independently or a bunch of spiders evolved it at once and then a bunch of different species lost, lost it. it. Yeah. That's the only way that would make sense. So kind of the most easy, the path of, path of least resistance in terms of evolution and this kind of stuff happening is most likely it happened twice. Most likely it's another case of convergent evolution just like, you know, bats and birds, just like flying squirrels and sugar gliders. It's a good so, solution. It's a good, right? good energetic energy engineering solution. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Men and women have the same number of ribs. What? I, uh, men and women both have 12 pairs of ribs. But in the Bible, I actually have the Bible back. It has backwards. nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> we're supposed to have one less. We need, to, we need to have a rib cage counting. Some people have what's called a floating rib or an extra. There is an extra rib occasionally, um, but like one in a hundred people. And what's funny is I got the rib urban rib. legend backwards. The urban legend is actually that women have one more rib. So <laughs> even when I was, <laughs> so you I was going the other direction of the urban legend. <laughs> Double wrong. Boom. Um, extra wrong. Well, we lost Blair. Should we... Uh, oh, no. What? Yep. I do think that it is time for us to take a break. We are going to take a little time for everyone to go check their interwebs and, you know, count their ribs. Count your ribs and put it count in, your uh, ribs and, and listen. Put it in the chat room. Let us know how many ribs you have so we can get this thing right. <laughs> That's right. We look so back. So men and women have the same number of ribs is what I missed. Yes. Okay, correct. <laughs> and, and that I got the urban legend uh, rib backwards. I, it was supposed to be women had more. Oh. So I was well, completely because, wrong. Oh no, it's from the Bible because man, Adam the, and Eve, God yeah. took Adam's right. rib to make he right? ate his rib, or he planted a rib. I don't. <laughs> I took out a rib, sucked We're, a rib, planted, planted it, and I grew a lady tree. <laughs> you guys. A little more thoroughly. It's time for a break. Great. Okay? Time for a break. Go into the break now. <sighs> Hey everybody, why don't you try heading over to twist.org, that's our website, twist.org, and checking out our Zazzle store. Zazzle store, it's in our main header bar, header bar, the store link is there, it'll take you to the Zazzle website, zazzle.com slash this week in science, science is the direct link, but our Zazzle store is filled with all sorts of merchandise that is twist oriented, you can wear our logo emblazoned all over Things that you enjoy wearing or carrying around with you to the grocery store, tote bag, stamps, maybe a twist set of twist stamps to mail letters, stick on your letters. Whatever you want. Well, not really whatever you want, but there's lots of stuff in there that we know you'll find and enjoy. So check it out, twist.org, our Zazzle store for our merchandise. Support us. Buy our stuff. Shout twist to the world. Twist is also supported directly by listeners like you by your donations that pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we like to hire, fun things we try to do, all sorts of cool things, really. And we do appreciate any amount that you are able to give. A dollar to a hundred dollars, two dollars to two hundred dollars, whatever you're able to give, it supports us and it helps us do all the stuff that we do. And we accept donations in a couple of different ways. We have PayPal buttons all over twist.org. PayPal, PayPal, PayPal. Hit a PayPal button and you'll be able to pay us through PayPal. Um, 
Additionally, we have an account with Patreon, and we are trying to fund our work through Patreon. Patreon is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash This Week in Science. Patreon dot com is kind of like Kickstarter, where you can support us per episode, and then also get stuff in return, twist stuff that isn't available to other people otherwise. You only get it by supporting us through Patreon. Whatever you like to do, whichever way you prefer to support us, we really appreciate it, and we suggest that you go to the website, twist.org, and listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, get involved in talking about the science, and make a donation. If you can't afford a donation, that is fine. We don't only like the people who can give us money. Seriously. Everybody is a part of our community, and thank you for being a part of the Twist community. You got more network out there? Why don't you tell Twist about the rest of your social network? Use social media for the powers of science good. We really appreciate your support. Could not do this without you. Thank you. Shows the way to go. No conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. And we're back with more science. I hope everyone counted their ribs. Got 12? Got 13? How many ribs did you count? And the ones that you were just eating, those don't count at all. All right, everybody, you're listening to This Week in Science. Let's talk about some more science. How about microbes? Lay them on me. Yeah, microbes are super fun, super awesome, uh, except when they do things like cause cancer, create ulcers, all sorts of terrible things. Jeez, microbes. Recent research out this last week shows a link between eating carbs and fueling colon cancer by feeding the microbes in your gut. So there is a new report out in Cell Journal. It's right up there. It's a heavy hitter along with science and nature. Uh, it, it's a mouse experiment. Uh, gut bacteria are were the culprits in explaining why sugar-heavy diets can cause cancer and why we think Western diets especially have high levels of colorectal, colorectal cancers. It's the third on the list of the big killers for, for Westerners. Um, it hits developed countries a lot harder than others. Uh, probably has a lot to do with what we eat and how we eat it, especially currently our diet being heavy in high fructose corn syrup, um, and just processed sugars in general. Um, we already know that there are links to uh, disorders of the intestinal tract and colon related to alcoholism, alcohol, sugar, carb right there. Um, but this is one thing. They actually showed that m mice engineered to be prone to colon cancer, they were treated with antibiotics and by getting rid of intestinal bacteria, um, they grew less polyps in their colon and small intestines. And polyps are what you find growing in the colon and small intestine that eventually lead to colon cancers. They don't all lead to colon cancers, but that's where they start. Uh, they then fed them low sugar diets and low and also low starch, and those also reduced the growth of growth of polyps. Um, this isn't necessarily, you know, these are mice. It's not humans, but it is um, a pretty pretty definitive connection right there. It is, but there's also there's an also an element. And again, I, I I always bring up this trope of whenever we're talking about nutrition and food and the effects on health, we are just scratching the surface of the microbial interaction. But one of the things that's definitely true is a lot of the processed foods and things that we eat these days 
get digested pretty readily high up in the digestive tract. Yeah. And less processed foods make it down further and can then be devoured by microbes further down the digestive tract. So part of it also could be a starvation of microbes in the colon because processed foods aren't allowing enough nutrients to make it that far down the system. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of yeah. elements to this, you know, and it will come down largely to what we because that's how we affect our 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 microbes. And if we're eating if we're eating less fiber additionally, fiber um, if you're eating more processed foods, less fiber that allows um, more of the digestion to happen more quickly. Your digestion is sh is slowed and stuff is actually digested better digested and better absorbed along the length of the intestine when you eat fiber um, so there's a there, the researchers are saying following a well ba balanced diet with fewer refined sugars and more fiber is good for the microbiome and likely has an effect on cancer predisposition yeah yeah what I'm saying yeah sugar what you're saying sugar I love it ah oh, bad um, additionally, um, a, a recent study this week found that he, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, hones in on little tiny lesions in the stomach. So if you have some kind of acidic trauma in your stomach that starts to create a small little cut or tear or little lesion that normally wouldn't be a problem if you have a, a lot of H. pylori in your system, they swarm on damage on the surface of the stomach. And um, that is is where uh, ulceration is promoted. So there, it, it's an interesting combination of the microbiome within our stomachs and whether it might not be the disease call it causing stuff at all. It's just, oh, something happened in your, in your stomach. You have a small, little, tiny, tiny microscopic cut or tear and the H. pylori there just go, bam, we are going to get it. And then you have an ulcer. Dope. Dope. Thanks, H. pylori. On the good side of bacterium, bacter the bacteria spectrum, um, rats that live in the Mojave Desert are able to eat creosote, creosote bush leaves. Creosote bush, bush leaves have toxins in them that we can't eat. Most people can't eat creosote resin. Um, it's this. It's coated. It's mainly comprised of nordihydroguaretic acid. It's well, terrible. Can cause liver damage, cysts in the kidneys. Terrible stuff, right? You, who wants to eat that? However, these these rats in the desert chow down. Publishing in Ecology Letters, a group of researchers have shown that their gut microbes consist of creosote-consuming uh, microbes. That these microbes actually uh, help metabolize the aromatic compounds in the uh, in the creosote resin and make it not toxic. It's great. And these animals also had a higher abundance of one gene, an aryl alcohol dehydrogenase, which probably allows these particular microbes to be able to exist at higher, in higher proportions. Nice. Yeah. This study, too, didn't they have some of the little rats couldn't um, digest it anymore, and they did a fecal transplant, and it fixed them, I think? Oh, I don't know about that aspect of the study, but that's neat. Yeah. So I think I read this, and um, and they did a fecal transplant, and then all of a sudden these these little buddies could uh, <laughs> could digest it again, which is pretty cool. It makes me wonder um, when people have weird digestive restrictions, when humans do, if we could do potentially fecal transplants with them, and maybe fix them. It, it is the they're, future. They're, you, they're doing it. Yeah, fecal transplant, transplants are becoming common. Well, not common, common, but they're, That's they are awesome. happening. They are happening more and more regularly, um, and they help people become more and more regular, I guess. <laughs> I think it's great. Listen, yeah. koalas, the reason that their babies can digest eucalyptus is that the babies eat their mother's poop when they're growing up. 
And that's basically a fecal transplant. That's basically yeah. what they're doing. Give me your yeah. bacteria. Mine. Yummy, yummy, yummy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and I, I think there's a whole, we're learning so much about, you know, the bacteria that cause problems, bacteria that help maybe expand digestive uh, what, or nutritional options um, that can help with digestion. Um, and if we can figure out how to transfer bacteria, maybe it is fecal transplants. It's the way to go. I just sort of have this picture, too, of this, like, Business Insider article. <laughs> interview. Yeah, well, I started the organic farm. I wanted to live off the land and, you know, be as holistic as possible. Uh, and, and, yeah, well, there's no money in it, really. It was a lose-lose operation. And then the fecal transplant boom hit, and I was in business. Let me tell you, <laughs> I made millions sending people my sample. <sighs> the future is huh? getting really interesting. It is getting so interesting. Tell me how to get ahead in the future. So, so here's, this is just a random bizarre thing somebody noticed uh, in a study. It's, it, 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 this is University of California, Riverside. The, their discovery is that having a whiter face is a benefit in the workplace. And it actually helps men when they negotiate for themselves uh, to get to get more more money at work. One of their one of their studies they found that men with whiter faces. Blair, if anybody who can see Blair right now, she's puffing <laughs> out her cheeks. <laughs> We're gonna have whiter faces now. Wide faces. Found that men with whiter faces negotiated signing bonuses of nearly twenty two hundred dollars more than men with the narrow face. That is significant. Mm -hmm. Strong. Well, not, in another scenario, that they found that when men with wider faces were selling a chemical plant, they negotiated a higher sale price than men with a more narrow face. However, when those same wide-faced men were in the buyer role, they negotiated a lower price than the narrow-faced man. <gasps> so they were actually, when they were negotiating for themselves, uh, to get something, to get money, they were they were doing better. But they actually, they in the, when the, when they're in a negotiating situation that requires compromise, they did less well. So they. It, I thought you said they got a lower price when they were negotiating to buy. Right, because it seems like you. But so here's the thing: I'm selling, right? I'm not compromising. Nope, this is what it is. This is the price. I have a wide face, so you pay the price. I need a deal. Can you give me a better deal? If you've got a wide face, eh, no, you don't need a better deal. You're being too uncompromising. I don't know. It's a weird role of us. You'd think, you'd think it would work in every time. Uh, final scenario, research assistants were given a series of questions that assess the attractiveness and beauty of a research subject. Men were paired off and given the same scenario in which they needed to come up with a creative solution to bridge a gap on a real estate transaction. And researchers found that the more attractive men this isn't the white face, but just the more attractive men were more successful in the negotiation. This study shows that being a man with a wider face can both be a blessing and a curse. And awareness of this may be important for future business success. So it just depends on who you send in to that boiler room to do the negotiation. If you're selling, well, we got the guy with the MBA, yeah, but he's got a narrow face. Let's Let's get that guy with the, from the mail room who's got the really wide face. Yeah, he'll get the best price. So this is something that's, in, that's interesting to me is that um, there's some been research looking at attractiveness and attractiveness of individuals in a group. And the, the ideal attractive face is not what you would think it is. You, it's not... <laughs> it's not like some extreme supermodel face, like some, you know, it's, it's not something that's striking in that manner. Actually, the most attractive face is the same as if you were to take all the faces in the world and blend them all together. It's an, hmm. it's an average. The most attractive face is symmetrical and just average, actually. And so it's interesting that you can have they paired the men up, men off with the wider faces in this in this uh, financial schema. And the when the men were in a pair, they did worse. And so what that's saying to me is if 
and, and, oh, the, the other thing about this is when you see people in a group, it's kind of um, you benefit from what your friends look like. So if you, you're you out with your friends, your attractiveness to other people is being averaged by other people's brains and how they see you. So you are, a, beca your face becomes averaged with the faces of your friends and so you become more attractive in a group than you are when you're alone. It's a really interesting perception thing about the way that our brains see faces in groups. They don't, it's harder to pinpoint a single face and, it, and our brains kind of mix things, mush things all together. And so in this, with two men with wider faces, basically they got averaged and probably the people were like, they have a very wide face. <laughs> huh, so, yeah, so there was some two aspect really attractive people get together and do a podcast. Right? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed asked an interesting question in the chat room. He said he wonders if there's a correlation between a wide face and a big body. Overall, is a big guy more intimidating? And that's a great question. Yeah, they were they were focused on the face. They didn't they didn't delve into that very much. But mm -hmm. um, because is the wide face coupled with some sort of locus on some sort of chromosome that is linked to something else potentially that we're picking up on? It might not be the wide face. It might be something else that's linked to it. There's also uh, testosterone increases jaw size. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking for sure. So there's definitely going to be some. Thickening and widening of the face, at least in the jaw region. Mm -hmm. Maybe men with high, it, it, maybe it signals higher testosterone. And are the men yeah. with wider jaws better at negotiating, or are they getting what they want because they're being perceived differently? Those are two very different things, also. Right? Or is the person negotiating with them the so whole time many. instead of focused on being focused on the negotiation, going, "Wow, that guy's." Face is really big. Well, look at the size of his jaw. Look at the I'm just size saying, of his it face. Sounds, <laughs> it sounds to me like they didn't do an excellent job of um, isolating variables. At least not in the version of, of this that I've read. Yeah, because you kind of need to isolate your variable. Uh, a variable. But, uh, that uh, good science. There you go. My next story. <laughs> what? Now what? Hmm? Okay. Okay. Here we go. The University of Miami Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science is suggesting that we may need to change the Bahama, uh, uh, the Bahamas to the Sahara Bahama Islands. <laughs> Basically, what they're they're they've sussed out, having done analysis of sands in the Saharas and in the Bahamas, is that it's very likely the sands on the beaches of the Bahamas came from. The Saharan Desert. Hmm. Yeah, That's and this interesting. is you know, this is uh, uh, okay. So what did they do? They 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 analyze the concentrations of trace elements characteristic of the atmospheric dust, iron and mag uh, manganese, 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 and uh, under 270 seafloor samples collected along the Great Bahama Bank over a three-year period. Team found that the highest concentrations of these trace elements occurred in the West Andros Island, an area which the largest concentration of whitening white sediment laden bodies of water produced by photosynthetic cyanobacteria. I can't talk anymore. What did you just say? <laughs> so basically, um, it matches what was coming from the desert. Well, yeah, it would, it, we know that there are winds that pick up dust and sand and smoke and other things and loft them into from the Sahara from China even from um, but from Africa definitely and loft them into the atmosphere and bring them to the East Coast across the Atlantic over to over to an area like the the Caribbean yeah. where the Bahamas are yeah. Yeah, I mean the process you got to take into an account to build up all that sand this is a process that's been going on for a hundred million years uh, but yeah, you look at uh, the Sahara Desert lists mineral rich sand in the atmosphere, travels 5,000 miles, a uh, bunch of it drops in the US and in the Caribbean, and that's where the sands of the Bahamas 
largely come from. That's really amazing. It's like the whole world is somehow connected. Each segmented labeled part of it is some way, shape, or form connected to something else that's going on far, far away. Just like the just like the Sahara, so mm -hmm. are the sands in the Bahamas. <laughs> in the hourglass. That's right. Yeah. You know where and, I was. And going. I don't know I don't know if we have the stomach for this next story. I want it. Give it to me. Uh, okay. Oh gosh. I don't even know if I can read this. Uh, this is University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I'm um, yeah. Link between ritual circumcision and herpes infection in infant, infants was looked at. Mm. It's a rare procedure occasionally performed during the Jewish circumcision ritual that involves direct oral suction. Uh, what? <clears throat> it's likely a source of herpes simplex virus type 1 transmission documented in infants between 1988 and 2012. Uh, oh. <clears throat> this is not okay. The, no, the practice, not okay. The practice known as Metsitza <laughs> Okay. How'd that sound, Blair? <laughs> uh, we'll go with it. Just Metsitza go ahead. Metsitza uh, is, and it's linked to HSV-1 infections. Has been a, this has been a very, an issue of debate, uh, big debate. Uh, in the Metsitza a Mohel, Mohel? Mohel. Mohel person trained to perform Mohel. circumcision orally extracts the small amount of blood from the circumcision wound and discards it. That's the <sighs> And so they're sufficient. They're saying clinical evidence to suggest the practice is a source of infection and therefore a risk exists. Though the extent of the magnitude and risk is not well defined, warrants further investigation. Uh, this largely started because two infants died where others experienced some mild to severe symptoms of the virus. And though more than half of American adults have this herpes 1 virus, it's the cold sore, oral lesions. Um, you know, I guess for people who have this, it's not a big deal. But in infants, it can actually be pretty serious. It can have, uh, they can become sick quickly, have high fever, seizures. It can cause death. So, wow. So I'm going to go out on a, out on a limb here for, um, there are reasons that certain things are done ritualistically. And one thing we do know is that there is um, a certain amount of sterilizing or cleaning ability of the saliva. And so when you get a wound and you, you cut your finger and you suck on it, you are, you are cleaning the wound as well. So the blood itself coming out will clean it. So I'm going to, there, there are many things in different, traditions that come from um, things that do work. But this is something that I would say at this point in time, probably would, there should be discussion about maybe just not doing it anymore. Right. So so part of this, of course, comes from... It's, it's, we this have alcohol This wipes isn't now. a standard procedure. This isn't even in the realm of the orthodox procedure. This is what's being called an ultra- orthodox procedure. Right. So it's a very small circle of individuals who are actually uh, still carrying on the metzitza. But, you know, yeah, this is the reason why, this is the reason why you need to update traditions, understand the source of the tradition as you so clearly illustrated there, Kiki, and and actually update it for the world in which you're, you're, you're enacting your ritual, procedure, or belief. 
Yes, because sometimes the uh, the risk become to the risk to an individual becomes too great, and so and that's that seems to be what this data is suggesting is that the the risk to children is too great. And I wonder when I wonder when the when the when the Moyle tradition the Moyle this tradition yeah and goes wait <laughs> I'm supposed to do what um. Is there another, maybe is there a less orthodox version of this I could participate in? Because yowza. Yowza. Seriously. All right. That, 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 was, that, that was something I could have gone without hearing about. Right? Can you, do yeah. you know, I kind of want to unhear it? Um, <laughs> Can I unhear it? <laughs> quick, 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 uh, quick other teaser last story I've got here. Yeah. Um, Finding finding ex uh, bombs with lasers, they've they've developed a a little laser detector that can fit on a chip. Basically, it's beating the dog, the bomb sniffing dog, in consistency, nice. and they're working on it now to, to to make it something available that you can have in every airport, you can have in any you know sort of secure location that you're kind of worried about. And it's it's micro parts per billion. I mean, it's it can it can sniff if it's sniffing better than a dog, uh, that's pretty good. But yeah, it's it, it was wow, as good as concentrations of 0.67 parts per billion, even 0.4 parts per billion. That's like really 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 small. It's incredibly small. Very sensitive. That's great. Being able to do it in in the laboratory is one thing. Being able to do it in in an airport, you know, repeatedly when people are going through, that's another thing. So being able to create the sensor that will actually work within, you know, applicable situations. That's what you. That's what they need to do. That's crazy. And then we'll just people will find new types of things to carry around with them. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of last stories. Lionfish. If any, if any, have you guys heard about the lionfish research? Six-year-old, not six-year-old, sixth grader reported on saying... Oh, I, I, saw, I saw the teaser for this somewhere, but I didn't, I didn't read the story. Yeah, so lionfish are thought to be um, saline inhabiting animals, so salty ocean animals. However, um, a the story has come out. It was first reported by NPR, um, paper published that is um, published with the with this sixth grade girl for her science project, and she is it was her science project, and then she was since involved in a paper that was published on the on this study. Found that lionfish Teroeus volitans are capable to tolerate brackish waters and actually um, move very far up um, estuaries into low saline waterways. Mm -hmm. And these um, lionfish are not so, they're, they're not so great. They're predators and they're, they, they could potentially uh, significantly impact um, these low saline environments at, as they move into them. People didn't, uh, and so it's a neat thing. Something cool that the sixth grader did. Uh, she was able to provide more information on exactly what salinity the lionfish could tolerate, and so therefore you can uh, also estimate from there how far these lionfish could move into an estuary. Um, but since then, um, a not a recent PhD graduate named Judd, um, he's, he's frustrated. Zach Judd is frustrated because he was the graduate student doing the work on this and he published a whole bunch of papers and then this sixth grader goes and gets all the credit and nobody <laughs> said thank you to him at all even though his research was the research that this little girl's research was based on. And then when people did start correcting it and including somebody's name, they included his his boss's name. They included the PI who was 
his advisor when he was a graduate student who was the last author on the papers, Zach Judd being the first author on these papers. Zach Judd wants his due credit. Mm -hmm. I mean mine. I mean oh mine. God. I mean mine. And I get it. My advice to Zach, buck up, ugly duck. You'll be a swan someday. <laughs> I think, you know, it's cool. A sixth grader, she was was working with her father. Her, her father does work in Albury Arrington, is the executive director of the Loxahatchee River District, was also a co-author on Judd's 2011 paper on the lionfish in the estuary and the 13 year old did help on the project and so um, so the 13 year old Lauren was in, did work on this project, was inspired by it. Her father said that the thinking that she did to come up with this particular thing, it was all her own thinking even though Judd says, but I was thinking about doing it and I just didn't get my paper written before she did her stuff. You have the opportunity to inspire not only one child, but a generation of children at science fairs to go out there and do some science. And you're going to ruin it over a me, my, I, me, mine little... No. He wants to get a job. Greater is good. Well. Greater good at work. Yeah. Greater good at well, work. Well, but I do understand... You know, at first, I it sounded like it was just an oversight, but if she worked with him and knew him and her father knew him, that is kind of a bummer. That, Super bummer, yeah. That he, didn't, he should have made it in there, and I understand why he's upset, but maybe if he wants to make it into the limelight again in a positive light, he shouldn't publicly complain about it. <laughs> Yeah, so I I don't know. I hope Zach Judd's research, he goes on and continues to do this. I hope he gets a job doing this. He has inspired, his work inspired this young girl to do her project. And, you know, and therefore, indirectly, will inspire all sorts of other sixth graders to potentially ask questions. You know, hopefully it's a, it's a trickle-down effect to curiosity. I'm from the team, bud. Yeah. Take one for the team. Yeah. <laughs> that would be rough. It would be tough to create something and have some 13-year-old steal it from you. I would That's be a little annoyed. some 13-year-old punk you for your school money or your lunch. Ah, what? No, this is not right. That would be really <laughs> frustrating. I would crush that 13-year-old girl. girl <laughs> <before I left. laughs> Too much. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it's just the media who tended to run with the story and leave Judd out. In the paper that Lauren is is in, Judd's work was um, and in her in her science project as well. She credited Judd, and so scientifically, everything has been credited appropriately. However, the media has not given Judd the limelight. You're not 13. That's why. And I've, it's I've not been, as exciting a story, which is unfortunate. I've been corrected by the chat room. My mohel is a, is a moil. A moil. A moil. Yeah, I was saying that, but then my internet cut out. <laughs> Mo what? Moil. We needed you to fix the pronunciations. I love though, that that procedure phonetically is b p at the end. It's b p a probably, but... <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's, it's like the most... It's the most absolutely, like, a word that actually describes... It's an onomatopoeia? <laughs> it is. Not actually. Kind of, but not it's really. Visceral word right there. Yeah. Another really cool thing, speaking of cutting, um, it's published in <laughs> PNAS. <laughs> cutting in PNAS. It's a journal. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. <sighs> Researchers uh. are using a um, are using a using a, a virus to be able to get into cells and snip out HIV. They have um, used a retroviral genome editing system, CRISPR Cas9 genome editing system, and it is it, they're using it to cut out. HIV from cell lines and it seems that it doesn't just go in and cut out the active uh, 
the active segment of HIV from the genome in those cell lines, but actually goes in and cuts out multiple copies that are lurking dormant within wow. the chromosomes. Which has been which has been like one of the biggest hurdles the biggest is problems. that HIV has this submarining. It's like a whack-a-mole thing. Like mm -hmm. you can whack-a-mole some of the HIV, but other elements of are going to pop up somewhere else later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a very, very cool technique, this CRISPR-Cas9 approach chops up things. Um, so far, though, limitations. Some t it could chop things up that don't need to be chopped up. So there are other potential side effects that come out of it. So it's, <laughs> it's not just a, yay, this works, but uh, maybe there are... Uh, there are teams that are working on different approaches using this CRISPR geno genome editor to flesh out latent HIV um, so it can be eliminated with antiretroviral stuff. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. And I think that's all my stories. Blair, did you have a meerkat? Yeah, just a couple things. Meerkats, um, the, the mothers, the matriarchs are pretty mean. <laughs> They uh, beat up their daughters and other females in the in the group if they try to have babies, and then they will actually commit infanticide on babies that aren't theirs, even their own grandchildren. And so that's kind of not been known exactly why, other than that the female's dominant and she just doesn't want anybody else's kids around. Well, they found out experimentally that the females are fatter and healthier and her own children are fatter and healthier when she bullies and performs infanticide rather than when she doesn't. So she directly does benefit from keeping other babies from being born. So how come I never saw well. any of this in Meekrat Manor? Uh, because it was for children. Oh, yeah. Look, children. Here's Grandma. She's, wait, what's she doing? Oh, my God. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's um, not good. Oh yes. So I had mean meerkat mothers, and then my other alliterative headline is covetous canines. So uh, dogs act jealous of other dogs. Um, they had dogs watch their owners play with a dog-like robot, and then a not-dog-like robot, and then inanimate objects, and they had the, the humans all act the exact same as if they were playing with a dog. Come here. Come, look at your fuzzy face. They had them do that with a fake dog, with a jack-in-the-box, and some sort of inanimate object. And so the dogs, when there was another dog and the owner was doing that, they were trying to get in between the owner and the dog. They were, try they were barking. They were even sniffing at the other dog. And so it looks like dogs recognize when their owner is playing with another dog, and they are, in fact, showing signs of jealousy. Wow. Yeah. Jealous. How to make your dog jealous. Three easy steps. Yeah. <sighs> All right, everyone. I think we have done this show. I would like to give thanks to those of you who have supported us on Patreon. Kevin Donald, Wesley Ballard, Paul D. Disney, Sam Windsor, John Ratnaswamy, Judy Gar... Judy, I keep... It's something about the moving between those names. Rudy Garcia, I'm sorry. Bo Hartweg, Mark, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Patrick Cohn, Kevin Parachan, Jason Roberts, Shane and Tara Ginsburg, Brian Condren, Byron Lee, E.O., Bob Calder, Jared Lysette, Ulysses Adkins, Jake Jones, Sarah Chavis, Michael, Rod Miller, Stephen Surowiec, Leila Amir Sadegi, Marshall Clark, Charlene Davidson Henry, Violated Gorilla, Don Kamarechka, Randy Mazuka, Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Larry Garcia, Alex Wilson, Stephen B., Daryl Lambert, John H. Maloney, Jason Olds, Gordon Grant, James, Paul West, Lauren Lang, Thomas Mikanen, Alec Doty, Illumin Lama, Nick Gradwell, Dan Rambo, Dougal Campbell, TMRO, John Specht, Miko Pakala, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Jason Martin, Marjorie, Scott Luch... Sorry, I'll try that one over again. Scott Lejewski, 
Philip Shane, Tyler Harrison, Ben Ruthig, Colombo, Ahmed, and Gary Swinsberg. Thank you so much for your support. Everyone out there, if you're not already supporting us on Patreon, why not? We're at around $435 per episode. We want to be up to $500. Help us get there. Try and help us out by supporting us on Patreon. Sign up this week. Do it. Also, once again, next week, we're going to be back. We're going to talk about more science, and we're going to be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch. You can join our chat room. Be part of the fun. If you can't make it live, don't worry. We also have past episodes at youtube.com slash thisweekinscience. You can subscribe to that and become our YouTube subscriber or at twist.org. That's where our audio podcasts live. Well, you can also sub subscribe to our RSS feed. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile device, you can search for Twist for Droid if it's an Android device, or Twist, T-W-I-S, if it's an Apple device. Right. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. You muted yourself, Justin. <laughs> or you can contact us directly. <laughs> Simply email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also ping us on the Twitter, where we are at twistscience, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview haiku <laughs> that came to you in the night, please, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from tonight's show, please let, please let you forget that one thing. But if you've learned anything else from tonight's show... Remember, it's all in your head. I swear I hit the button. Oh, it's all turned down. There we go. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science Science, science. science. This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science I've got a 
got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness, I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one? You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. And that is the end of that for this. That is the end of that, everybody. That's yeah. right. Headbanging is hard to do with headphones. <sighs> yeah. Headphones, Jackson Fly. I, I don't Jackson have any. Fly gets the nightmare fuel for this week. Yeah. Oh, hey, did you hear that we almost died in 2012? But not really. No. It's not. It's not that we would. It's not. It's not a whole death thing. People have been like, ah. Oh! I almost died. The Washington, the Washington Post reported a story, um, or I think I think David David Eckerd sent it to me uh, from the Washington Post, and then somebody else put it into the Twitter feed that um, there was a massive solar flare, and it just so happened that we were just past like a week. It was like a a, a week out of rotation or something, so it missed us. But basically, an analysis of the solar flare researchers are like, oh, don't we were in trouble with that one. If it had hit us, it would have caused some serious problems. It was the biggest solar flare um, in 150 years of monitoring solar flares. And it would have been like the one that probably would have overloaded our uh, electrical systems and led to massive power failures and infrastructure breakdowns and all sorts of stuff, yeah. but it didn't happen. It's a scary thing that we actually, in this day and age, haven't insulated ourselves from this eventuality. We haven't. We haven't yet. And currently, um, the in the article, it quotes some statistics person, somebody who does statistics on things. Some guy with some numbers. With some numbers, uh, saying that we we have a 12% chance of a That's solar high. flare. Which it's pretty high. How much? 12%? A 12% chance of a solar flare. Here it is. There's the, there's the story. Let me make sure I've got what the story actually said. 12% chance of a Carrington-type event, which is this kind of massive CME that was observed by a um, solar researcher in 1859. Um, it, let's see, 12% chance of a Carrington event. I just totally lost that page. But, uh, d -d -d here on Earth in the next 10 years. According to Pete Riley of Predictive Science Inc. So 12% next 10 years. It's it's high. It's not in, not like it's going to happen kind of high. It's not like a heads or tails kind of thing. Um, but it's pretty high. It, you know, the... We the should be preparing for these things. Hmm. We, we have built out our infrastructure for so long. Kind of knowing this was there, out there, somewhere, possibility. Eh, when's it going to happen? Eh, well, in the future. Well, it's a kick the can kind of thing. And it is one of these things that, hey... If we're looking to, like the disclaimer, look for a big thing that we could get behind in a today and a now. You know, what a job builder. What a what an infrastructure. Forget, you know, building a pyramid that we wouldn't know what to do with. Other than say, oh, look what we did. 
But this is one of those things that could put all the out of work Americans back to work, going around. Like if we took all of the money that's being spent on the F thirty five and we decided to put it towards yeah. infrastructure projects and we actually like gave that. Americans jobs, uh, like real job. big jobs. And, yeah, yeah, okay. I want a good job, but yeah, no, absolutely. We could we could definitely create a giant public works program, insulate ourselves from this threat, and you know be done with it. This week's Nightmare Fuel Award goes to Jackson Fly for once. <laughs> Sorry, Blair Baz, maybe next week. Thanks, Gord. Yeah, I think the nightmare would be if I wasn't properly briefed at the Briss that we were having an ultra orthodox uh, ritual taking place. Mm -hmm. As soon as the moil made the move, I'd be like, What are you doing? I'd just freak out. Yeah. Ugh. Stop yeah, that. that would be pretty terrifying. Oh. You have to, yeah. Hmm. Oh, identity four. Thank you. Do you know? I I can figure out. Don't I can fix I can fix things and edit things together. I don't know how bad it was, but I I can fix things maybe. Also, so. Or you can just give me notes and I'll edit it and fix it out or whatever. Thank you for recording. I appreciate that. Uh, there was, yes, a wicked solar flare. Is there really anything you can do about that or are we all just human toast? Uh, apparently you, there is a way to insulate Absolutely. much of the grid to prevent it from having the catastrophic... Um, effects of shutting down the grid. And you got to think. You got to think of the 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 little things. You know, I don't know if an airplane. Uh, I remember the blackout of two thousand three. That was uh, massive. That was a cool one. That was a big blackout of the in northeast. Uh, high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I remember. So we've been doing twist long enough, Justin. That I remember. I remember when this solar flare, uh, when this solar cycle was starting, mm. and we reported many stories about how it was supposed to be the most active, potentially big solar flare cycle that we had seen in decades, and so there were people reporting. There were stories about how our infrastructure has been hacked together and just kind of patchwork pieced together um, for so long that the probability of a big giant Carrington event happening would very likely take down our grid. And people were telling the White House, people were telling Congress, people were telling their representatives, infrastructure needs to be fixed. And nobody fixed anything. And luckily, until this particular event that is being discussed now, um, it's been a fairly quiet solar cycle. It hasn't been the biggest. It hasn't. We haven't had these massive events, um, other than this one. And we are lucky that it missed us because we. Are, this is not new news that our infrastructure is lacking and that these, that there and there are. Um, there, I think there are capacitors or parts that could be fitted onto. Um, old electrical lines to be sure. able to take the kind of surge that would occur in the event of a giant solar flare, but but it's a political people, it's a political issue. It's where is the money going to go, and so it's not a yeah, scientific it's not issue. Anymore. Go. It's also it's also it's also kind of a political issue because um, part of the upgrade, part of the the planned upgrade, there's, there's another big reason to upgrade the electric infrastructure, which is that we lose about 50% of electricity in the transmission. And it's this whole idea we could have a smart grid system that was much, much more efficient at transmitting electricity down the line. So mm -hmm. all the energy production that we're doing, if we're losing half of it uh, when we create electricity, that's an enormous loss, right? Um, from what I understand, though, part of the problem in this was politically... Uh, some prominent yet controversial liberal uh, by the name of Al Gore got way out ahead of this issue and is a major investor in companies who were ready to do smart grid. Yeah. 
and because of the political uh, atmosphere that is our, how our country fuels its emotional pleas to populism, uh, that's part of why there hasn't been any motion on this. It's part of, it's part of. Part of uh, Twitter Refugee is saying no one has mentioned that the U.S. grid has a limited number of super transformers and we only have one or two spares. Yeah, and um, T Twit Refugee also mentioned that um, the worst case scenario of a giant solar flare hitting and burning out much of the um, the electrical grid, not it probably wouldn't be everywhere because there are some because it's a patchwork and not everything is necessarily connected well to everything else, and so some things would probably survive, so, and other bits of the patchwork quilt of of grid across the country would not. But many areas of the 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 worst case scenario with something would be that many areas of the United States would be without electricity for six to nine months. Right. As repairs yeah, were not done. Not a big deal. You get to know the family. Yeah. Um, I just have to wonder what that would do to just the candles. social structure of everything. <laughs> well, and here's what I don't know either. I don't know if you're in an airplane, does the airplane lose power? I don't know if it's affected. But I figure where you were going to be landing, <laughs> all of a sudden being out of power, could be kind of a big deal. It's terrifying. Like satellites? Do satellites get new? I don't know how well insulated satellites are. You'd think they're insulated no, to a this, No, that's... That's another. That's another thing. Satellites that uh, they would they would be out. The so then, does it also just, does it matter which the satellites? Way yeah. The Earth happens to be facing at the time we're hit. Is there a? Does it hit the atmosphere and that's what does it globally? Or can you be hit by a solar flare and you were luckily you know it was nighttime and you didn't get hit? Or does it last for long enough that everybody gets? I don't know how this even works. Okay, let's think about this it for a second depends. though. It if all depends. If there was no electricity for months, mm -hmm. there, that would be a problem. Right. We don't have the infrastructure to have food without refrigeration. Yep. Forget that. People don't have yep. board games anymore. What are we going to do oh, for I have, I have five under my bed right behind me. <laughs> is, that, is that your safe place? So, I keep, my, okay. I keep so, my board games well, for when the electrical grid goes out. Bug out my destination, bed. Then. <laughs> I also have about five decks of cards. Okay. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. I have a place we can go. I have paper <laughs> books. I, I have, have many paper, paper books. books. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. like this knitting needles and a crochet hook and yarn. I have so much stuff. But hot rod is gonna hot rod is gonna oh. get fit. Hot rod says I'll have to ride on the electric electric generator bicycle every day for hours. Yeah, well yeah. it would be it would be a lot of generators. It would be a lot of um depending on gas, diesel for those generators. It would be um I don't know. I, I think some people would be able to work it out and probably build small communities of pe communities where they can wire generators together and maintain refrigeration to a certain extent. Maintain um, it. I mean, it wouldn't knock everything out completely. So, and communications would be down, though. Yeah, but look what I've got. Communications would be down, which would make everything really hard. I've got I've got the ability to have light generated light. Woo. And and this one here, this one here, this emergency little uh, back of the up thingy, not only has lights on it, but also has a Ooh. USB plug in so that I can recharge my cell phone. Nice. You can recharge your cell phone and use work. it I know. for her. I, know, I, know work. I understand that. But I will have a functioning cell phone. Yeah, but there will be no like towers. I'll still have video games on my cell phone that I've downloaded to the phone. So whatever else is stuck playing board games, I'm sitting here totally crushing However, it. However, there are... Um, there is an there are people working on apps. There is an app out currently that uh, is phone to phone, peer to peer, Bluetooth. I don't know if it's Bluetooth, but it's um, local network communication. So there is the potential for off network communication, even if the satellites are down. 
based on like your phone connecting to a neighbor's phone connecting to like bouncing through the phones that are on locally. So if these kinds of things can be made more widespread, there could be the potential for communications at a primitive technological form um, using smart devices. I, I'll also just just for I rec I'll also have a working MP3 player in the Armageddon. Uh, I will also be able to have a working recording device in the Armageddon because I have a USB charger. If you don't have a handheld USB things. charger, send 1999. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, right? But like this is like the coolest thing. Actually, this is supposed to be. It is pretty cool. It's a it's a from the American Red Cross is actually who created this. This was designed for you went out on a camping trip and your cell phone died and uh, because you got lost in the woods or something. I don't know what the exact scenario is, uh, but you needed to charge up to be able to communicate again, and that's why this exists. But, uh, yeah, all anything that, that can hold a charge USB style, you can still have while your neighbors do not. That's right. Keep and get your music out of the cloud, people. Yeah, cloud storage won't be cloud, there. The cloud will be down. Cloud, what is this? The cloud will be down, people. That kind of thing is not going to work. Yeah. I like that what Dr. Morbius said that there was a movie called Solar Crisis that was kind of this this kind of a a thing. And there are there are plans, emergency plans in place for things like earthquakes and disasters of various types, so I'm sure that there's a certain amount of disaster preparedness along those lines for Steve a situation asks, in this court. What will you eat, Justin? Your mm -hmm. shirt? Uh, not if I can help it. However, I happen to be in a densely agricultural rich area, and this goes way back. This was this goes way back mm. to any sort of armageddon -y type scenario. This has been worked out since high school for people who grew up in this region. I've got three different giant bean silos <laughs> that are my first targets in the event of an Armageddon, which, yes, means we'll be eating nothing but beans, but you can load up an SUV, back it up to the silo, fill an SUV full of <laughs> beans, and that's what, that's, it'll be, it'll be good not for exactly me. the vision of the future that you have. Franks and beans. You do, you do that, you do some fishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can like grow radar. some food that you could you could get under control. That's what I would do. Is I would run first thing to the gardening supply store mm -hmm. and just load up on seeds. That's what I would do. And several months from now, because there's lots of food. Starve to death. Well, <laughs> no, no there's lots to. of food. There, I think you could supply food for a few weeks, but you can even get some plants that within two or three weeks they're gonna start growing. They're gonna there's gonna be something you can eat. Cilantro, maybe. I can only I can only, what, I can I only grow what, things. I wonder what the on hand capacity of food is to sustain a neighborhood. And I'm I'm thinking in terms of if there's a Costco Ten miles away, and there's within that range four or five supermarkets, right? How much? How for how long? Without being resupplied, how long do you figure those can actually? What about refrigeration? A week. Yeah, and, right. And without refrigeration, so we're talking dry goods. We're talking. We got to focus on the canned food, the dry goods. You know, you you you'll hit the veggies first. You hit all the perishables. Well, that's the one. other question. Are we just all going to resort to looting immediately and then there's going to be a black market for pretzels or is the <laughs> government going to be able to keep things under control and divvy out food? Yeah, it's interesting though. Ed from Connecticut says more and more people are going solar and wind power and moving off grid, which is true. And there are a lot of um, big box stores that are actually going, putting solar panel, panels on their roofs and supplying a lot of their own power by solar generation. Um, you know, it's not 
probably enough to supply any everything, but it might be enough to keep their refrigerators going or their yes, freezers I, I going. Think, a little I think bit you're longer. right. We would get a lot more volunteers for Science Island. In fact, it would just be like Science Island everywhere all mm-hmm. of a sudden. Yeah, there, I think that we are on the right track with alternative science energy island. and salt, uh, Science Island, but distribution of power so that more people are producing their own and giving back to the grid and there's less... Making it more affordable. Making it more affordable. Yeah, Yeah, I think we're on the right track, but it's just, it's things like a solar flare that are, it's close and it didn't quite happen to remind you that, oh yeah, 10 years ago we were talking about this (laughs) and nothing has changed, (laughs) except maybe in the last 10 years there's been a bit more investment in the green, green technology front. I think we just need to make Science Island and get off this grid, man. Leave yeah. these silly humans to their ways. Hat Identity 4. I've played Minecraft. All I need to do is punch some wood and find sheep to make a bed. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Canned tuna and baked beans. Identity 4 says, Option C, the government will resort immediately to looting and leave us all high and dry. Yeah. So things oh, will go my back dad to normal just quickly, quit. please. I, want, I keep wondering if Kiki's daddy in the chat room is my dad. <laughs> I wondered that as well. <laughs> or if it's just some strange person who comes and lurks and has a creepy name. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not creepy at all. I don't know why you're saying that's creepy. <laughs> I hope it's really my dad. <laughs> Bye, dad. He's like, ah, I live out in the country. Go away, people. A lot more people, yeah, a lot of people have generators. A lot of people have generators. Hot Rod, just move home because there's always food at Mom and Dad's. <laughs> there's also there's also a f- uh, fresh water concern. Uh, so much of the water is pumped to places. Good gosh. A place like Los Angeles would be terrifying without electricity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If the grid goes down, that place is going to be scary. Right? Central Valley, we got rolling rivers. We got lands full of agriculture that won't be able to go anywhere, so they got to just distribute it locally. I feel pretty good about where I'm at all of a sudden. Eh, it's a little hot in the summer, but... Wait, what? No internet? Oh, no! Arr, right. Yeah, no internet. But Twit Refugee was saying, I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be internet, internet. But if you could get a, a local network going, mm-hmm. you could get, and Twit, Twit Refugee was saying, if you could, could create power and get power to the cell towers, then you could still have at least local cell communication. Ooh, or better yet, local broadcast. We could be the only show on the air. <laughs> and they have to listen to us. You have to. You want to. You know, it doesn't matter. If we're going to talk about science, and I hope it's all positive. At the top of the hour uh, traffic report, there are still cars parked everywhere on the freeway going nowhere. Would that happen? There we yeah, are. Why? It... Can't pump gas. No electricity Traps for pumping gas. Jam and there you are. You think people would do that? You don't think they would go park at home and go, okay, I'll Just keep my car home. here? Uh, no. Because that's what I would do, because once the, the electricity is back, I want to be able to drive to a gas station. Several months from now, but if you're talking yeah. about months. Okay, Blair, do you want to be where you are right now, or would you rather be next to your family? I will walk there. <laughs> well, you're in San Francisco. You can walk there. Not where else can walk there. I don't care where they are. I will walk there. <laughs> but yeah. oh, well. being in being in San Francisco, I've often uh, because it is kind. Of, it's an island, basically. I mean, mm-hmm. we have the peninsula going south. But if the bridges are shut down for whatever reason, I've always I've always had this kind of backup plan of could just get a backpack, hike down to San Jose, and then just hike inland. (laughs) Hike inland to Stockton. You could take a rowboat across the bay if you had to. Take take, San Francisco 
uh, scenario is going to suddenly rely very heavily on traders up and down the Delta River uh, mm -hmm. who can traverse those distances by In sea. Boats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you're going you're gonna to be trying to steal our food, our tomatoes, our corn, our rice, our giant bean silos. But we'll trade with you for what you've got because you have to offer the epicenter of the tech industry, which will be completely useless, useless to us. <laughs> but we do have a lot of beer and wine. Ooh. True. But you should still be able to be uh, brewed um, with, like, gas and fire. Um, okay, okay. Uh, moving on to new business. Uh, did you, did the both of you, did you receive, did you get the new script? Yes, I read it. I oh, read I my parts at least. It. Yeah, right. You yeah, like your part? Did you like your part? Do you like the part? Do you like the part? I do you like it. You do like it? Yes. Kiki, do you not know that you never found it? You never saw this? I haven't really been able to do email. This I'm, in your spam I'm having a really mindset. hard time with. No, no. You, yeah. oh, yeah. so I don't understand how email works. I don't get. You didn't no. ever. I go right to your spam box, don't I? No. <laughs> I well, he had to really text me because I, I the email I that you have for me just is my spammy email. It's oh, well, so you got to update me with it back. I'm That's the only one that was on here. file for the account from which it uh, was sent. Meshnet. Mm. Um, I like how Justin, you just so happened to write your character into a love triangle. <laughs> this is what yeah, I thought was intentional. Amazing, is is. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this too. I'm gonna keep this. The character normally like it's like Doctor Who. You have different companions, right? Doctor mm -hmm. Who. They goes through a companion. They have this sort of awkward relationship thing that happens. It grows. Sometime he switches. He changes. He goes on to a new companion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Jack feedback. Have that scenario with two companions at the same time, not really competing, but just causing a lot of confusion within the group. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> it was funny how, like, nobody really addressed what was going on exactly. <laughs> right. right. So, like, the idea is Betty Bot is... Betty Bot... Wait, so robot. we're live, so I don't know how much you want to give away. Okay. Well, I'll just... No, this is just some basic stuff. Betty Bot's a robot, so she can't really get jealous exactly. Right. And Jack is just sort of... He's, he's very largely... Uh, what email did you send there's him a, from? There's a, there's a line from another episode where Betty calls him out for being able to compliment the girl without actually saying anything complimentary. Mm -hmm. And, or no, I think Bitka points that out. And then he says something that sounds like a compliment, but isn't really quite if you read it back, and she takes it as a compliment. There we go. So he's not really intentionally leading anybody on, but at the same time also not shutting anything down. Yep. No, he definitely does leading on in there. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> a little bit. But Kiki doesn't know what we're talking about because she hasn't read the episode. So I went back and I, I, re it. I rewrote the first episode of Jack Feedback to turn what was a very stereotypical professor character, side character, nice. into a stronger uh, female role for Blair. Nice. We like uh, that. I like from it. your Jack Feedback account. Yeah, Jack yeah. Jack that's, I've it. been working on this a little while. Hold on. Copy? Yeah, I, ben, I might have been spammed uh, into oblivion. I don't think I put twist somewhere in the subject line. I nope. may, <laughs> I may uh -huh. have forgotten to do the thing that I say every episode. I like that there are minions. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, was, those the before, record, was right? written before there were minions. Uh, Eddie, there's this me. Actually, actually, this episode predates Twist. The the writing of it. Yeah, this was an early one. This is this was the original one. For some reason, I never liked it enough to do it as the first recordings. I, I picked a couple 
different episodes to record first, so they've all been done unchronologically in the recordings thus far. Uh, but I think it's time to start from the beginning and get this one recorded. And it still might get, there's a couple parts it might get tweaked. Uh, Tony Steele, the artist emeritus of This Week in Science, has signed <laughs> up to do not one but two roles. Ooh, not one but that's two. That's awesome. He said, bring it. I want to do, I want to do more than one. So he's, uh, he signed up to uh, be a couple of characters. Nice. Um, I just sent you an email with the correct email address that you should use from now on. Ooh. But what email did you send it to? Because it might be one that I don't use. I sent it to the Jack Feedback one. Oh, I never use that email. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? I never oh, checked that good. email. I don't even know what the password is. I can sometimes I can send from it, but I don't you know how to receive. You can send from it, but you can't receive. No, no, because I used to get so much spam mail from it that I just blocked everything. Yeah. See, now my twist mail also is just hammered with spam. Right. Yeah. The twist one gets really. No, I have eight hundred unread. Wait. How do I? I don't even see what your email is. It doesn't tell me. You had to write your email in the email, otherwise I don't know what the email is. <laughs> right? um, now it just says your name when I'm responding to you, and I have no idea what that email is. What do you want me to do? Hang on. I got. I'm gonna go in. Okay, I see it now. All right, fine. Okay. Um. Oh my God. So. My twist inbox is all just um, Twitter notifications oh. <laughs> and um, like Wells Fargo and stuff like that, which I don't have a Wells Fargo account. So spam, 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 spam. Quick loan. We offer quick loan. Let's see. Uh, my spam. If I go into my my spam folder, get slim, healthy people daily. Apple online store. Oh no, my account has been suspended, but I don't have any Apple products, which is kind of odd because I, I don't even I don't even have an Apple product, and yet my account's been suspended. That's not fair. You can don't cry, don't cry. 15% off everything. <laughs> That's vague, but sounds very like a good thing. Uh, the New Yorker? I'm still, I don't know. I'm not going to get the New Yorker. Ooh, do. deals on Viagra. Yay. Amazon. Why is Amazon? You gov. Corporate Resource Services seeks publish purchasing coordinator for a client. That sounds very. Oh goodness. Ooh, give delight to your woman. Big man will satisfy your lady. Dear friend, increase organic traffic. Great. Something in Russian. Work online. All right, and this part of the after show is when we pass around the hat and we ask everybody to kick in some change. But just, just because we know you're all spread out across the country and throwing it from this distance, that change, by the time it reaches us, could actually hurt. So we'd like you to wrap the change in, say, a dollar bill and then throw it because then we're less likely to be... Or you could just go to patreon.com slash this week in science. Oh, patreon.com. 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 <laughs> that's such that's where did you get a nine hundred number voice? <laughs> where did that come from? Oh, it's always been there. Really? Can I hear it? Hiding. You now? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
Murra. <lacht> <lacht> <laughs> Do I sense another Jack Feedback character now? <laughs> that was amazing. I should have it a was like right there. character. In the next one you write, someone you should have some teenager from the valley have to talk to him. <laughs> I kind of do. So the next episode is a difficult one because I've been trying. It's the only unwritten one in like a series of six. Um. Well, but there's a character who very much could have like vocal fraud. Vocal fraud totally. Jack, <laughs> <laughs> Betty Bot. <laughs> oh my God, I would love that. That would be so fun. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I have to make that happen now. But we might have to spread out the taping over several days because otherwise I will destroy my vocal cords. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a Princess Lulu character in the next one that's going to be... I've always pictured it as sort of like if Paris Hilton was a, a, the head of General Electric or Halliburton or something. Um, it's going to be an interesting episode. Sweet. How do I know so much about 900 voices? Um, because when I was 12, 13, these things were being advertised on television and not really understanding the whole concept. My grandmother got a $250 phone bill that she had to have reversed. <sighs> yes. <laughs> That's, That's really ouchy. Funny. Oh, goodness. I like uh, Michael's comment from the Q&A. He says, everyone should have a front yard garden now. A veggie mm -hmm. garden, of course. I've got a good well, one. Well, backyard, because front yard is where all of the dogs are going to pee on it. Oh, yeah. I've got oh, a side. I don't even have a garden, uh, yard. I've just but got I, potted plants. If you've got space, you should, be ha you, should, uh, you should try having a vegetable garden. If you have space, right? Is that the... Is that what we're getting at? I've got potted plants, and I've got, like, the most amazing uh, group of giant tomato plants that are crawling everywhere. But I would have to live in my post-apocalyptic future. Apparently, is almost entirely tomatoes, got some mint, some Cucumbers. basil, Cucumbers peppermint. Cucumbers are pretty easy. i got an eggplant that's threatening to grow any day now. Any day now. <sighs> did you find it, Kiki? Did you find it? Did you see it? Did you find it? The did script? It? I did find it. I did see it. I found wow. out that I got my memory back because some guy with a... some lum glut with a toe fetish was biting my toe. Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> How did I get my memory back? Because a lum glut with a foot fetish bit my toe. You'll only know when this episode comes out. That's right. That's called a teaser. It's a pretty wild episode. A lot happens in this one. Uh, Jack, are any of the Jack Feedback episodes available online? Actually, um, there's one at SoundCloud, but I don't know if it's public. I don't know. i got to figure out a way to get these... It should be public, isn't it? You just make it public. I don't know where it even is. Actually, I need to kind of find that one. Um, but I need to... Um, i got to figure out a way. And I've been looking at maybe doing an Audible version of them for uh, audible.com. I don't know if that's the way to do it. I don't know how people can find these things. But If you were like going to do... You could do Audible or, once you had a couple... Mm -hmm. You could release them as a podcast in segments. Oh. Yeah. So you could have, like, a storyline that's broken into acts, and you release, like, 10, 15, 20-minute acts, like, You've once a week that. for three weeks. Oh. Totally. Yeah. And that would be fun because then, like... It's it's small form. I think it's easier nowadays for people to listen to audio if it's 
shorter, right? So, yeah. and it would keep them hooked, and then they'd want to hear the next installment. And I think that would be a really uh, right. fun so way here, to do here's, it. Here's then the here's here's the idea that springs from this. So what we do is once we've got we got to do a lot more recording. I'm gonna mm -hmm. do some more editing. I got like half the last one done. Mm -hmm. But what we get, what we could do then is we get it recorded, we get it edited, slapped together, and then we could do a post show of Twish where we do like a 15 minute segment each week. Where we play it? Yeah, we play it for like 15 minutes in the, in the post show. No. Even if it's just just me, you guys are gonna go to bed. I'll just play it. No, but it wouldn't work because if I hang up, then the then it ends. The who? So, I don't so think you have to stay awake for it. Yeah. Not my cloud. It's something called SoundCloud, Raymond. I don't know if it's visible there. Yeah, I, I like I like radio plays. I'm a big fan, Ben, of oldie time radio plays. It's it's you know, some people have the rainforest soundtrack playing when they go to sleep. The ocean playing. I've got like Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. <laughs> that's that's how I, I go off. I listen to the New Time podcast in the style of old time radio. <laughs> that is called the Thrilling Adventure Hour. It's very fun. I was just listening to it today while I was getting ready for this. I think I'd enjoy if I was gonna if I was gonna play it live. I think I'd enjoy it more with the chat room because that that would be fun to see what people think of it versus just putting it out there and having not being able to. This is what I've gotten very like spoiled by doing this week in science in the modern version. Where the chat room is part of the show, it's it's sort of like it's not just even an audience, but it's it's like the 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 chat room is part of the show. It's like we're all listening to something or watching something or doing this together. I think it'd be weird just to put it out there and be like, ah, it got downloaded. Somebody listen to it, because then you also all get to listen to it together too, which is I think more more fun. <laughs> Although typically by the time I'm done editing it, I need a lot of time before I could listen to it. it uh, yeah, if you're editing, it takes a long time before you can sit down and listen That's from to Connecticut. something. I grew yeah. up on radio, not TV. That is why I love Audible. Does Audible have radio plays or is it just books? Can you do radio plays on Audible? Can you put them up there so that people can hear them? On Audible, yeah. Oh. On Audible, you just it doesn't have to be a, a printed book. I don't think. I don't know. All I've heard about Audible is it's uh, audio versions of books. I've never heard of you know mm. radio plays up on there. Steve Everett, do people want to be able to submit video questions to Twist? Would people want to do that? Because that would be cool. I could work that out. Are you the only one? Mm -hmm. Who would like to do that? <sighs> All right, everybody. What time is it? 10.30. Mm -hmm. I know, was it, I think Minion of Twist, have you already started watching AM Coast to Coast or listening to AM Coast to Coast? Are you listening to us both at the same time? Is that weird? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there has to be a, a, a printed version for Audible for their A, I think it's AFX, is that... I think it's ACX, and yeah, they do want you to have a printed version first. Mm. I just I just found that. But so I guess what you have to do, this is all complicated. Got to go to Amazon.com. Print it. <laughs> do a. You have to be selling a print book version, which I guess you could just put it as a radio 
play script and have that be the book. Because you have to have the the book thingy number barcode. Yeah, number. but then it's a, you know, then then but it's a it's a radio play, so right. But I mean, this is the only way they're set up to do it. Yeah. And then they want you to try to get all these other people to read your thing, but I've already produced it, so it doesn't matter. So then, then I can put it over there. But then they also own it for seven years, if I'm reading this right. They own it for seven years, and they charge based on the time. So anybody listening to it has to pay them $10 or something based for an hour. But uh, if you're a member of Audible, I would assume that means you get all – don't you get all the content for free if you're paying a monthly thing? You get a certain number of downloads, I think, depending yeah. on your sub, on your membership to Audible. Oh no, I but I don't. Hmm. It doesn't mean a dead tree version. It just means there has to be an electronic version, like a Kindle version of the script. From if I'm reading this right. Uh, there has to be, there would have to be a digital version of the script on the Amazon book thing, and then, and then, because you get the ISBN number, then you get to create the Audible book version, uh, which in this case would just be uploading. Or as Gord says, buy the ISBN and never publish. <laughs> hmm. Or I could just figure out a way to play it over this show, over this thing. Or, or actually, and then the other thing is, too, uh, Tony Steele has been working up some graphics that go to it. You could so do... So it could also be uh, so something a version that's got, you know, graphic art to it. But also you could do... I, this is the original idea that we're trying to figure out. If you could do a YouTube... Thing, yeah. Where you've got the audio going along and you've got still shots of yeah. sort of scene headers, kind of still shots that sort of stay there during the action. What I was going to say, I've recently found out also there's um, a, a competitor, YouTube's competitor to Patreon, that they're going to be, I don't know if they've rolled it out yet, but it's they're going to do a uh, tip jar. And so anything you put a video out, and there's gonna there'll be a little thing for a tip jar. And so if people and watch YouTube. it and like it, they can oh, well, directly in YouTube. Logical. Yeah, that seems like that should have been there a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. YouTube adds tip jar for creators. Hmm. Nice. Hmm. <laughs> Greetings from Lake Wobegon, as written by H.P. Lovecraft, equals Welcome to Night Vale. Wow! I am going to have to check that out. Shunogo. Slapping that in the old Google later right now. Yeah, so we could either, um, you could either make your own Jack Feedback account and then on YouTube if you don't have it already and then um, probably be able to get tip jar and stuff. Very interesting. Yeah, this looks uh, very much-ish. Like the kind of thing I was thinking. Interesting. Huh. Somebody's already done the concept. So, and they got uh, lots of hit starts, so I think I'll try that. I think I'm going to go with the YouTube thing. Yeah, you uh, should. Put up the uh, Tony Steele images, the collective of voices. Yeah. And just put Oh, somebody found the uh, SoundCloud. They found excellent. <laughs> Let's see if this is the right. Yeah, there's the part one. There's a part two also. Well, part two. I don't know if that link is the same. It's got to be different.
are you are you uh, like what are you listening to? You're dump stepping over there. Where's the part two? I don't know what the I don't know what the thing is to part two. Not now, buddy. Oh, there's part two. Oh, it's all there. Not oh, Popeye. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. I'm gonna go to bed. Yeah, you do that. I'm trying to find. That's a, I'm trying to find my camera cord because I want to upload all my photos from Israel because I haven't done that yet. Mm. But I can't find the camera cord. <laughs> That's a problem, right? That's a problem. A little bit of a difficulty. Where is... I wonder... I have to look. Look, so... Key updates. Ah! Ah! All right, Facebook friends, Israel photos coming soon. Those quarters on the By the end of the weekend. This. Yay! Mm -hmm. I'm going to start yes. tweeting them too. So you guys follow at Blair's Menagerie <laughs> or at Shouty Blair. <laughs> I'm, like uh, muted. I'm muting you, Justin. Why? Why did you mute me? Because it's just this random audio in the background. Sorry, I turned it off. So, um, so, so by next week, I'll have those recorded. Is that what you guys are saying? Uh, no. I would rather yeah. come record them. Yeah, actually, I would I would prefer that too for uh for your part, especially for the scenes where it's the really quick back and forth with uh, Jeff. Because that needs that's got to be honed. That's straight out of that's straight out stealing. You got to go watch the movie uh, Netflix at some point, Double Indemnity. Okay, email it's me that. More film, uh, Double Indemnity. It's my uh, my favorite actress of the 30s through 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever. Barbara Stanwyck. I've got I've got a Barbara Stanwyck fetish. But she has this scene uh, with um, gosh, what's his name? The the dad from My Three Dads. <laughs> this, is, this is weird. But in this mark, they have this back and forth where they're like doing this sort of flirtatious es uh, escalation, right? That's just real quick back and forth, back and forth. It's sort of the inspiration for that scene. Uh, but you'll see it if you if you watch the, the that movie. Okay, send it to me. Send it to you. What do you mean, send it to you? Send me the name. Uh, double indemnity. Send me the name. Double indemnity. I'm sending yeah, yeah. up word, sound, voice, mouth, moving things. Yeah, I'm not going to remember that in that fashion. Oh, my I gosh. You. I don't know if it's the right name. Let me make sure. Look, a camera that's not attached to a phone, guys. Check it out. <laughs> It's weird, right? I was one of the only people on this trip um, that was not using my iPhone as my camera device. I don't like carrying multiple things around anymore, but you can get some really good either. pictures with just a camera. Yeah, plus your phone dies. A dedicated you device. The camera all day. Yeah, yeah. So, like, let's see if I can screen share some pictures before we go. Any really good ones? Pictures. Israel.
Oh, this is a pretty one. Whoa. Whoa. Just got an awesome pic of my daughter sent me. Yay. Screen no, show. Bam. Check that place out. That's a real place. It exists. Look at it. Whoa, that's pretty intense. Yeah. It's pretty. So there is water somewhere over there. <laughs> Only half of the country is desert. <laughs> Only half. Well, that's a good one. Here. Here's a picture of me. In the Golan. You can see Syria and Lebanon from there. Pretty cool. I I must just have I just must have a bad mind. What do you mean? I never I can't <laughs> so I was, the the thing was I was gonna say was So you named them? It's, <laughs> oh boy. I know. I know it's not even I'm not even trying. It just this is how my brain has been corrupted by the world. <laughs> Which I've... Right. Sorry. Here is Masa, the the or Masa, the view from Masada at sunrise. That's the sun poking out right there. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's one so of the better. This ones. is the half that's all desert, right? Yeah, gorgeous. Um. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're counting this as part of the country that's not desert and it looks like that. No, it's desert. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Anywho. Oh, here's a good one. All right, and then I'm going to bed. Here. Look at... That. Check him out. That's actually Pretty. in the middle of the desert. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. More to come. The All right. are getting sleepy. Yeah. Jackson fly. Broads, what did I miss? We lost some people. I need to go to sleep now. Yep. I'm yawning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, was that an Ibis? What was that? An Oryx? Ibex. Ibex. I Bex. Yeah. Nice. Nice horns. Yeah, they are pretty sweet. I love them. Yeah. All right, folks. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us till the end of the after show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us for Science Conversation. Thank you for imagining what the world would be like without electricity. Yeah. We hope to see you here once again next week. Thursday, 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Join us. We'll be here. We hope that you will be too. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Blair, also, for an Thank awesome you. show. Thank you. Being here. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody. Yep. Have a really good one. See you next week. Are we ending? Bye. Bye.
Bye.